Hi, welcome to the Martin Cordial Variety Hour. Today we're going to continue to write this story called Horse Smoke. We started writing it in our last live stream, and I've added a bunch more to the story since then. So now I'd like to go through what we've got and edit it some more and try to write some more. And I'd like to try to finish this story. I think I've figured out roughly how it's going to end. Uh, there is still some stuff in between that I haven't quite figured out. But um, I think I think it's coming together. There's a lot of bits that I don't like and there's a lot of bits that need a lot of work. But, but it's coming together. So let's write Horse Smoke. So first I'll just read through what we got so far. Every night was the same. As soon as he closed his eyes, he had that dream again. He was in a field of lavender, gripped by a hurricane. Everywhere were purple flowers buffeted by screaming winds. Black clouds boiled and churned overhead. The storm was suffocating, a torrent of air so thick and relentless that he felt like he was drowning, fighting for breath in his sleep. Amidst the tumult, he glimpsed a figure in the distance, a woman dancing in the storm, spinning with the motion of the cyclone, her hair and dress flying with the wind. Lavender flew through the air around her like a veil, so he could not see her face. She spun about again and again, and the storm spun with her, and no matter how loud he called to her, she didn't hear. When Erling awoke, gasping, heart pounding. He no longer smelled the lavender, only smoke. Maybe that should be only the scent of smoke. Nah, just only smoke is good. It was like this every morning. He woke up more exhausted each day. He could barely get out of bed, let alone drag himself to work at the farm. It couldn't go on. He needed an escape. So Erling crept from the homestead before dawn. He would take the car and drive until he was free of dreams. His brother Chico would be pissed. Chico used the car to drive to his girlfriend's place each weekend. But it's not Chico's car. Erling bought the thing, the bus. Erling started the ignition tentatively, trying to stay quiet. Tentatively, trying to stay quiet. He didn't want to wake his mother. She would only worry. So he backed out from the homestead slowly, under the leaning branches of birch, past the chicken coop, past the wire fences that kept the livestock. His home was painted in soft greys and shadows, the moonlight softened and shrouded by clouds. Yeah, we're saying soft twice there. His home was painted in soft greys painted how about in soft gray shadows in his home was painted in tones of soft gray shadow the moonlight shrouded by clouds as he rolled down their long dirt driveway a couple of forlorn horses watched him leave each horse was kept separately in its own fenced enclosure, and each had a barcode stamped on its flank. The horses would be picked up by the Bureau this afternoon. In their big, dark eyes, he saw reprobation. Erling shook the thought from his head and turned onto the Interstate 71. Only once he was ten miles down the road could he, could he breathe deeply again. Only once he was ten miles down the road... Did he find himself breathing? Only once he was ten miles down the road, was he breathing? Yeah. Mm. Mother and Chico would wonder where he went, and Cousin Belle would, too. But Erling knew that if he tried to explain himself, they wouldn't understand. He barely understood himself. He just knew he needed to drive. So he turned on the radio, loud, to drown out his doubts. Erling was doing 50 down the highway when he heard a strange clacking sound. He had just stopped to fill up at a gas station.
was something loose on the car, something wrong with the engine. He slowed down a little, but the clacking just got louder. It was a rhythmic sound, like drumming, four urgent beats repeating. Was he still dreaming? His head started to ache. He gripped the steering wheel tighter and eased off the gas pedal. He could feel his pulse thumping in his neck. How about he eased off the gas pedal and then gripped tighter? The sun still hadn't surfaced. The night still owned the sky, with only a faint orange glow on the horizon ahead, a dull ember in the east. Yeah, I don't know where to put that bit. Maybe the sun would never rise. Maybe he would drive towards the glow forever and would never reach it, stuff stuck in this half-light purgatory, never knowing if he's asleep or awake. Then something caught his eye in the rearview mirror, and Erling and Erling saw the source of the clacking noise. It was a horse, a dark horse galloping down the road behind him, hooves drumming on the tarmac. For a moment, Erling felt certain that he truly was in a dream. But he saw riders on the horse, pale faces in the gloom, and with a jolt, he recognized Chico and Bloody Bell. Erling pulled over. The noise ceased. The clacking noise ceased. The clacking noise, the clacking noise slowed, then ceased as the horse clopped to a halt. Erling. Erling stood up from the driver's seat and eased back into reality. Cuz, Bell said, you need to check your rear view more often. Bell was sitting behind Chico on the horse, still gripping his waist tightly. They were all sweaty and puffing from their wild sprint, riders and animal both. Bell's cheeks were flushed red, her hair blown into a wild tangle. Chico was missing a shoe. He coughed up a bug. The horse wickered. What the hell are you doing with this? Erling exclaimed, gesturing at the huge animal. It had a bureau barcode on its flank. Did anyone see you? You know that's not allowed. Get it back to the farm. Relax, Chico said. No one's out here. No one's awake. I ride all the time at night. He shrugged and almost lost his balance on the saddle. He appeared to be either very hungover or still drunk. Real question is, what are you doing with my car? It's not your car, Erling fumed. Well, I need it today, Chico said. So you can't go run off with it in the middle of the night. It's morning. Erling felt the heat rise to his chest. He and Chico had been having these arguments ever since they could speak. He knew it was stupid and th He knew it was stupid to He he knew the arguments He knew the arguments were stupid and that only made him angrier that he participated in them. And that only made him angrier at himself that he participated in them. I don't, know, I don't know an elegant way to word that. If someone sees you on that horse, we could lose the farm. You know the Bureau... Boys, Bell interjected. Boys, now is not the time for arguing. Now is the time for waffles. She clasped her, she clasped her hands together and smiled, but beneficent like a saint. Always the master conciliator, Bell. There's a diner back by the gas station, and I'm starving. Erling looked back towards the gas station, and then out to the glow in the east. Seemed like the sun would rise after all. Erling gazed back toward the gas station, and then out to the glow in the east. It was... seemed it. it looked a little brighter. Perhaps.
perhaps the sun perhaps the sun would rise after all chico he said take the horse back home please before someone sees before mum sees chico opened his mouth to argue then closed it he looked at bell then back to erling you owe me you owe me waffles bro he said and turned the horse towards home so that section is um we changed that up a bit because i think it's a lot more fun having uh bell and chico right up behind erling in the car like with them riding the horse i think that's a lot more fun than just like turning up outside the diner coincidentally and of course it brings in the horse stuff and sort of deepens the mystery about what the hell's going on about the horses so i i like i like that change erling drove back towards the diner with bell in the passenger seat chico was giving me a lift home when we saw you at the gas station he was so pissed you were driving his car he just had to chase after you on the horse have you ever ridden a horse? Chico must take Chico must have taken you sometime. Ah, oh, Earl, when we were racing up behind you doing the 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 what's it called? Cantering? I almost fell off. I could have died, she laughed. I tell him not to ride the horses. I know it's not allowed, but it was only to get to France's place and back at night when no one'd see. No one'd see. And it's fun, Earl. Horse rides are so fun. Bell sighed. Erling didn't comment. The party was great too, Bell continued. Frances' auntie brought her stereo and we all did karaoke. Chico munted in the dam. You should have been there. Erling said nothing. He should have been there. But instead, he'd been dreaming of storms and lavender. Instead, he'd been dreaming of lavender and storms. Lavender and a storm. It's always the same storm. Um, and so then we need to fill in a little more before we get to the diner, I think. Um, yeah, well, we could just use this. Belle hadn't slept all night, but unlike Chico, she showed no signs of slowing down. She chatted and she, ta she chatted animatedly, buzzing all the way to the diner's door. For a roadside diner, it was nice. The windows offered a wide view of the scrubby hills in the north. From a crackling radio, someone sang the blues. The place was almost empty. The only customer was a grizzled older woman sitting at the counter, nursing a fluorescent pink thick shake. A waitress emerged from the kitchen, a plump middle-aged woman. Morning, folks. I'll look after you today. Take a seat anywhere. Erling headed for a booth by a window. Not there, the waitress said sharply. Not there? Erling stopped and frowned. The waitress... For a moment, the waitress frowned back, but then she broke into a smile. Nah, no, that's just my little joke. Just my joke. You sit wherever you like, sweetie. Bloody Bell laughed. Come on, sweetie. Let's take a seat. Erling sat. It was too early for this. The waitress heaved two hefty menus onto their table. Each landed with a weighty thump. Just my little joke, the waitress repeated. You can sit wherever you like. This booth is fine. It It is haunted, though. She waved an index finger at Erling and Bell in turn, in warning. Quite haunted, this booth, yes. My husband died sitting in that seat right there, she declared, pointing at Erling. Erling gave a non-committal smile. Was this another little joke? How about we add Erling... Erling shifted uncomfortably. And gave a non-committal smile. Heart attack, the waitress pronounced. Massive heart attack. Every valve and ventricle busted at once. Blam! She pounded the table, and the cutlery rattled. It was on the news. The doctor had never seen anything like it. 
He wrote a book about it. We've got a co- I've got a signed copy on the shelf. I've got a signed copy on that shelf. She gestured proudly to a bookshelf in the corner. It was cholesterol, of course. I told Harold about the cholesterol, but he didn't believe it. She paused for a moment, face solemn, and then shrugged. You can sit wherever you like, sweetie, but it is haunted. I have to tell you that, for liability reasons. She smiled. Because of the ghosts. Ah, good, Erling said, unconvincingly. Belle said nothing. She just gazed at the waitress in open admiration. She just gazed at the waitress. Doe-eyed. In open admiration. The waitress clapped her hands together. Back to business. Coffee to start? Yes, please, Erling said. Won't be a tick, the waitress beamed, and swept back to the kitchen. Belle sighed. Can she be my real mum? Anything's possible, Erling replied, and paused. Belle was staring at his seat longingly. Do you... do you want to sit in the ghost seat? Yes. Yes, I do. Once Erling and Belle had swapped seats, they returned to their menus. They were impressive tomes, each menu a thick binder with some 200 laminated full-colour pages, including an index and several appendices. 200 laminated, illustrated, full-colour pages, including an index and several appendices. There's a two-page spread dedicated to fresh oysters, Erling said. We're a thousand miles away from the nearest ocean. They do an omelette with 18 different kinds of meat in it, Belle observed. Chicken, bacon, and lamb, but also pheasant, spotted dingo, star-nosed sloth. Some of these are cryptids, I think, she frowned. And at bargain prices, too. They can't have adjusted for inflation since the 40s. I think that bit's less funny, so maybe we'll take that bit out about the prices. The waitress returned with a steaming pot of coffee and two kitschy coffee cups shaped like happy chickens. What can I get you folks? The waitress asked, paper and pen at the ready. Erling glanced again at the menu, but it raised more questions than answers. I'll just have eggs. Quite a lot of eggs, please, and bacon. The waitress jotted on her pad. Then Erling frowned. Bacon from a pig, please, he added. The waitress nodded and made an additional note. And for the lady, she turned to Belle. Do you do chicken waffles? We certainly do. Have you perused our butter menu? Oh, I haven't, Belle said, searching the index for butter. No, the butter menu is in a supplementary volume, the waitress explained. I can fetch it if you'd... No, thank you so much, Belle said. That sounds amazing, but I'll just have whatever you recommend. Whatever's your favourite. Excellent choice, the waitress enthused. I'll have that right out for you. She leaned in conspiratorially. Just watch out for Harold, my husband. Chicken waffles are his favourite. She touched her finger to her nose, winked, and then returned to the kitchen. I didn't say what kind of eggs I wanted, Erling realised. I hope they're from a chicken. Could be lizard, Belle said, hopefully. She poured coffee for them both. Then she grabbed the bottle of maple syrup on the table, and with an expression of great concentration, began to pour maple syrup into her coffee. Cuz, she said, as she poured. Why are you here? Where are you going? She kept her eyes on the amber stream of syrup into her coffee. Erling grimaced, glanced out the window, at the wall. I need some time. Need to sort out some things. Need a need a different place, you know? Belle frowned. No, I, I don't know at all. You don't talk to me anymore, Earl. You haven't come to the barn dances in months. 
Auntie says you're like a zombie at the farm. I've tried to call. What What's going on with you? Erling stared at Belle's coffee. She was still pouring syrup into it. Earl, talk to me. A- enough with the syrup, Erling snapped. Jesus, do you want to end up like Harold? He was too loud. The old woman at the counter glanced at him curiously. Belle met Erling's eyes with a start. Slowly and deliberately, she stopped pouring and eyed him darkly as she sipped from her chicken mug. Erling closed his eyes for a moment. Sorry, Belle. Sorry. Look, I I haven't been sleeping. My head's not right. I need... I don't know. I need a doctor. A doctor? Why didn't you say? I know a great doctor. Erling was dubious. A doctor or a dealer? You can be both, Belle protested. Seriously, I've been seeing him for years. He's just down the road from here, actually. A proper, holistic, neuropractitioner. Herbalist, vibe chemist. You need sleep, you got anxiety, uppers, downers, diagonals, whatever you need. He'll sort you out. Diagonals? Look, he's an expert. A professional. He is your guy. I don't know, Belle. You know I'm not into that stuff. Well, where the hell else are we going? She said, exasperated. You don't actually have a plan, do you? Where are we going? Erling sighed. He didn't know where the we came from, but she was right. He didn't have a plan. Fine. We can visit your dealer, he sighed. Doctor, she insisted. Erling shrugged. What's his name? Big Rev Crowley. Erling snorted into his coffee. Ooh, Bell explained. Here's the waffles. The food was good. Bacon was perfect, and the eggs were from chickens, as best Erling could tell. Bell sang the praises of her chicken waffles. I never had butter like that, ever. Not ever. She left a few morsels on her plate, though. For Harold, she said solemnly. Erling and Belle both slumped into their seats in satisfied silence. The sun outside had risen. It peered weakly through a, through a veil of smoke. It peered weak and pale through a veil of smoke. Erling noticed that the old woman at the counter had finished her thick shake and was glancing at him again. They made eye contact. Erling smiled politely, and the woman took it as an invitation. She ambled to their booth unsteadily. Decorative medallions on colourful ribbons jangled from her grey hair. Her face was wind-worn and tattooed. Her breathing was laboured, but she was persistent. Belle slid across Harold's seat to make room for her. Thank you, dear the woman said as she settled in to the ghost seat. I couldn't help but overhear your conversation earlier. She looked to Erling. Sleep troubles, eh? There's lots of folks having sleep troubles around here. Erling blinked through his food coma. Are you? Aye, all up and down Kalamak country. County? Cunt? No, country. The woman spoke quietly almost a whisper, and Erling had to lean close to hear her. He'd really prefer to just sit and digest his lizard eggs in peace, but the woman didn't stop. Her voice was a whisper, but her eyes were piercing, fixed on Erling. Lots of folks having nightmares. That got Erling's attention. Belle glanced at him warily, and the woman continued. It's because of the horses, you know. The horse smoke makes everybody sick. At that, Belle rolled her eyes. Erling knew what Belle thought of horse activists. There's always been horse burning in Kalamak, Belle said. Since forever. It's our heritage. Horse burners built this country. She gestured broadly at their surroundings, as though their granddad had built this very diner. The old woman turned to Belle, 
The medallions in her hair tinkled softly. Aye, there's been burning for a good long time. For as long as there's been people here, they say. These days it's mostly horse ranches, of course. Good, wholesome family businesses. I'm sure you know all about that. She kept a steady gaze on Bell. But things have changed lately, haven't they? Since the Bureau moved in. Now most of the ranchers sell their horses to the Bureau for burning, up in those new plants in the hills. Plants that are funded by overseas companies, sending power to far-flung coasts. Is that our heritage, girl? Bell's face darkened. She turned to Erling. We don't have to sit and be lectured, cuz. We've broken fast and the road needs hitting. She stood, but the old woman didn't move from the booth to let her pass. But where's your rusty steep? But where's your trusty steed, girl? She said. I saw the horse you rode in on. I can still smell it on you. And I saw the Bureau's brand on its flank. She chuckled. Curious, that. The Bureau has strict rules on the use of their livestock, and their notorious sticklers for enforcement. If they knew that some farm girl and her and her boyfriend was galloping down the 76 on one of their burn animals, that could stir some trouble for a wholesome family farm. Um, gotta sort of make the plot make sense though, um, because now that Belle and Chico were riding the horse past the gas station, then the woman didn't see Belle arrive at the diner on the horse. She saw Belle and Chico leave the diner on the horse, and then she might have seen Chico ride the horse on the way back. And yeah, she she, she just assumes that the guy, Chico, who Belle was on the horse with is her boyfriend. Like, that's just what this woman assumes, even though it's not true. Unless we decide to make that true. I don't know. Whatever. Bell glowered. Drink your syrup, girl, the woman said. Bell sat. Erling knew the woman was right. The Bureau's inspectors had visited their farm several times, and each time Mother's anxiety was palpable. The Bureau's agents were exacting, and their decisions final. If the Bureau cut them off for breaking their regulations, stopped buying their horses, it could ruin them. Money had been perilously tight since Dad died. That's why they started selling to the Bureau in the first place. So Erling cut the shit. What do you want? He asked the woman. She shrugged. I want a great many things. New hips, for a start. And I want my poor dead Jack Russell back, the most faithful man I ever had. But no, dear, I don't want you to give me anything. I want to give you something. An invitation. Belle huffed and groaned. Erling stayed stone-faced. Some friends of mine are staying in Yarna down the way. An old, on an old horse farm, not so different to your own, I'm sure. I suggest you pay them a visit. Stay a few nights. Listen to what they have to say. You'll find it enlightening. What the fuck sort of blackmail is this? Belle shook her head. We're not joining your bloody commune. Report me to the Bureau if you want. I'll deny it. You can't prove anything. Oh, Sruthi, the woman called over her shoulder. Turned out she had a loud, clear voice when she wanted to. Yes, Tara dear, the waitress replied, popping back in from the kitchen with soapy dishes in her hands. Did you see that wonderful horse that this fine young lady and a young man rode past your... That this fine young lady... That this fine young lady... Yeah. 
Did you see that, that wonderful horse that this fine young lady rode past your diner? Oh my, yes, the lovely chestnut, Saruthi replied. I haven't ridden a horse bareback in oh, 30 years. Used to ride myself, in fact. That was how I met Harold. She winked and returned to the kitchen. Old Tara turned back and lowered her voice again. See, Sruthi has a wonderful memory. She remembers every customer, and she'll happily share her recollections with anyone who comes asking. Bell scowled. Erling kneaded his forehead. So, he said, how do we get to Yana? So, so is that clear? What's going on there? Um, is it is it obvious what's going on? Like Tara is blackmailing Erling and Bell by threatening to tell the bureau that they were riding a horse, which is against the rules. And so Tara is saying, "You've got to go and talk to my friends who were in Yana, and if you do that, I won't dob you into the." Bureau. Is that is that obvious? Is that clear that that's what's going on? I think it is. I think it's clear enough. Obviously, the details and the motivations are still very unclear, but that's the basic idea. They passed 14 dead animals by the road that day. They passed three gas stations, one dry lake, and Bell complained 136 times. That crazy bitch, she said. Psycho hippie coot. Who does she think she is? Fucking Gus Fring, Don Corleone, Dolores Umbridge, Crypt Keeper? Would have left us be if I slapped a Sea Shepherd sticker on the bloody horse's ass. What are we supposed to do at her clubhouse? Eat magic mushrooms and braid each other's hair? I could do that at fucking home. Earl, if we get Jonestowned by a bunch of fucking horse-hugging geriatrics, I will haunt that geezer so hard, I'll team up with Harold. And a terrier, too. No, it's a Jack Russell, wasn't it? And a Jack Russell, too. We'll put a horse head in her bed if she loves them so much. Put bloody ectoplasm in her thick shakes. Belle went on like that for 180 miles. With each mile... Erling's head hurt worse. He could smell lavender. He could taste it. Once the sun started sinking down to meet the hills, Bell took over driving and mostly stopped ranting. Erling stretched out in the back seats and started to feel better. The Rev is along the way, at least. We'll get there by sundown. He'll let us crash at his place, so long as we buy something, Bell said. Earl saw Belle's smile on the rearview mirror. She turned on the radio and sang to herself until they reached the Rev's place. Big Rev Crowley was not what Earl imagined. He was small, for one thing. A slight, soft-spoken man who could have been anywhere from 24 to 44 years old. A slight, soft-spoken man in a collared shirt, who could have been in a neat collared shirt, who could have been anywhere from 24 to 44 years old. He did not seem surprised to see Bell and Earl trudging up his driveway in the dusk. Lovely to see you, Isabel. He gave her a warm hug. And you must be Erling. I've heard so much about you. Erling got a hug too. Crowley was a hugger. Crowley's place was unassuming. Another post-war three-bedroom brick house on the edge of a... on the edge of a... half-abandoned town. Corrugated roof, native garden, solar panels. Please, come out back. And that's, uh... That's as much as I've got written so far. So I, I, I think this is, like, halfway... I think that Bell and Earl, they're going to have this meeting with Big Rev Crowley, and he's going to dispense some advice and possibly some pharmaceuticals, and then they're going to proceed to Yana, and they're going to meet 
Tara's Horse Activist Associates. And then they're going to end up in one of the horse plants in the hills, and there's going to be a confrontation. And I think I know roughly what will happen there. And then there will be an exit from that place, and then the story will be done. So I, I think we're like halfway. Um, so I need to figure out this... I need to figure out this Crowley meeting. So let's, let's have a look at that. Um, welcome, everybody in the chat, Rager and Klaus Hammer and Lars and Matthew and Melvin. Um, yeah, Chico is Erling's brother, the sort of uh, big, boisterous older brother um, who does not seem enormously helpful, but, you know, he's living life, he's living large. Um, and yeah, I, I like Bell as well a lot. I think Bell is really fun. Um, but isn't it interesting that Bell supports horse burning? We still don't know much about what horse burning is exactly, but it's something that seems, it sounds bad, doesn't it? Uh, and Bell defends the practice of horse burning, even though she's such a fun, lovely character. So, so I hope that sort of, um, forces people to be a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but yeah, let's all right. Let's try and write this this Crowley situation. I don't really know what we're doing here yet, but but we'll find out. Please come out back. Um, Crowley's backyard. Um, was overgrown. Crowley's backyard was overgrown with uh, foliage. <laughs> I don't know. I'll decide what kind of plants later. Um, along the back fence were rows of wooden cages and enclosures. Um... Bell Bell swept up to one and greeted a marmoset <laughs> with great enthusiasm. <laughs> I look after injured animals, Crowley explained. Nurse them back to health until they're ready to go free. Um, Erling nodded with interest. In the cages, he observed a dozen different kinds of birds um, a badger uh, several marsupials and a disgruntled looking um, lizard. Perhaps this is where Sruthi's diner <laughs> uh, got meat for her omelettes. <laughs> Can I feed the birds? Bell asked. Of course. Crowley said. You know where to find the seed. You know where to find the bird seed. Um, remember to watch out for Terry. 
he still bites. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even know what we're doing tonally. Like, it, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like moody and, and introspective and, and serious from Erling's perspective, but like most of the characters are like silly. Um, especially Belle and all these side characters. I, I think that's kind of a fun dynamic. Like the protagonist is sort of serious and grumpy and everyone around him is just fun and colorful. And I, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm enjoying it. Um, so, you know, so, you know, er Erling's just here because Bell dragged him here and he had nowhere else to go. And Bell, I think, has a relationship with Crowley as like a drug dealer, but also like a really sort of wholesome mentor, father like sort of figure, I think. Um, and what I want to do is get Erling into a conversation with Crowley in his aquarium room because he has an aquarium room. Uh, so maybe instead of asking to feed the birds, Bell should ask to feed the fish. Um, and then that'll, con that'll bring us into the aquarium room. I think that makes sense. Um, I, I, I enjoy Crowley warning Bell to look out for Terry though. So I mean, we'll, we'll save that for later. Maybe, um, can I feed the fish? Bell asked, of course. Crowley smiled. Come inside, please, both of you. Come inside, you two. It's too... Come inside, please. Crowley's living room was full of fish tanks floor to ceiling every surface was glittering every Crowley's living room was full of fish tanks floor to ceiling Shimmering water through the light about the room. And colorful fish danced across. Crowley's living room was full of fish tanks, floor to ceiling. Shimmering water. Shimmering water through the light about the room and colorful fish danced and colorful fish danced amongst and colorful fish danced among seaweed and whimsical aquarium decorations Um, well, despite what we said about the light, um, the room, the room was dimly lit, giving the whole space a dreamy, surreal, the, the whole room was dimly lit, giving the whole space a, dr a dreamy, surreal feeling, or giving Erling a dreamy, surreal feeling. The only furniture, besides the, you know, but the, the only furniture for humans, as opposed to all of the aquariums for fish, the, yeah, um, uh, <laughs> amongst the fish habitats, the only furniture 
for humans were a few cushions set about a low table in the center of the room. Crowley sat. Um, uh, what can I do for you? What can I do for you both today? Crowley sat. Crowley sat cross legged. What can I do for you both today? Is it the usual for you, Bell? No, Bell said. Well, yes. My vape's running low, actually. But also, Erling, Erling would like a consultation. I'm sorry to spring him on you, but you know you said you're always happy to Um, Crowley hushed her with a smile. Of course, a dear friend of yours is a dear friend of mine. I, th I think Crowley is an almost irritatingly sort of, you know, serene uh, type, serene, mystical sort of type who, you know, I feel like this character might annoy Erling, actually. <laughs> um, but they're, they're going to have a conversation nonetheless. They're going to discuss Erling's dreams. Um, Grousel Hurts in the live chat suggests that we... Uh, use Mid Journey to create an illustration of Crowley's living room. I think that's an excellent idea. Because, uh, yeah, part of the initial concept for these Horse Smoke live streams was using AI to generate images to illustrate um, the story. So let's do that. Let's use Mid Journey to type in um, a, a room where every wall is covered in aquarium tanks. Um, lots of light. Um, uh, through the water. Um, colorful fish in the tanks. Whimsical aquarium decorations inside the tanks. Um, uh, the room contains a low table and three cushions on the floor. I, I have no idea whether <laughs> Mid Journey is going to do a good job with that prompt, but that's what we've put in and it'll generate that now. All right. Um, so let's just read back over the Crowley stuff because we're working this out live. Big Rev Crowley was not what Earl imagined. He was small, for one thing. A slight, soft-spoken man in a neat collared shirt who could have been anywhere from 24 to 44 years old. He did not seem surprised to see Bell and Earl trudging up his driveway in the dusk. Lovely to see you, Isabel. He gave her a warm hug. And you must be Erling. I've heard so much about you. Erling got a hug too. Crowley was a hugger. 
Crowley's place was unassuming. Another post-war three-bedroom brick house on the edge of a half-abandoned country town. Corrugated roof, native garden, solar panels. Please, come out back. Crowley's backyard was overgrown with foliage. Along the back fence were rows of wooden cages and enclosures. Bell swept up to one and greeted a marmoset with great enthusiasm. I look after injured animals, Crowley explained. Nurse them back to health until they're ready to go free. It started with... It started with just an injured coyote. It started with just a... Coyote that got hit by a bike. But pretty soon, folks all around Kalamak started coming to me with their injured wildlife. And now I've got half a zoo on my hands. He laughed. Erling nodded with interest. In the cages, he observed a dozen different kinds of birds, a badger, several marsupials, and a disgruntled-looking lizard. Perhaps this was where Sruthi's diner got meat for her omelettes. And, you know, I am being uh, deliberately uh, obtuse about, like, the geography here. Like, we're mentioning coyotes and marmosets and marsupials, so it's like, where is this place exactly? You know, Kalamak country? Like, what? Where? Like, I, we've got sort of an Americana vibe um i think on the road on the diner but it it is deliberately obtuse about where this is i think this is an imaginary place crowley's living room was full of fish tanks floor to ceiling shimmering water through the light about the room and colorful fish danced amongst seaweed and whimsical aquarium decorations the room was dimly lit giving the whole space a dreamy surreal feeling as the light as the light was um, distorted and as the light shined, as the light shone through the, um, as the light shone through, as the light shone through reflections dancing off the water from a dozen as the light shone through a dozen as the light shone, shone through countless reflections and refractions dancing off the water amongst the fish habitats the only furniture for humans were a few cushions set about a low table in the center of the room crowley sat cross-legged so what can I do for you both today? Is it the usual for you, Bell? No, Bell said. Well, yes, my vape's running low, actually. But also, Erling would like a consultation. I'm sorry to spring him on you, but you said that you're always... Crowley hushed her with a smile. Of course, Bell. Of course, Isabel. A dear friend of yours is a dear friend of mine. Erling, would you like to take a seat? Would you like to sit? Would you like to take a seat? Erling rather would like a seat, but since there was only a cushion, he took that. Man, Erling is such a grouch. <laughs> Erling is such a sour, grumpy grouch. Um, all right, let's have a look at what we got from mid journey oh i thought last time we could just copy the we could just copy the files across um let me see all right this is what mid journey gave us um, and like I sort of suspected, Midjourney did not really get the specifics of the layout correct. Like we said that it's, you know, 
aquarium tanks on the walls, but some of these have fish, like, swimming through the room magically. Um, I think it still captures the sort of mood of it a little bit, but, um, you know, yeah. And they all have, like, a sofa, and I never said sofa, I said cushions. It, it always sort of defaults to, like, a, you know, something that's similar to what people have done before, you know? Um, so something I, I do like to do with Mid Journey to try and um, make it do something more interesting is to increase the chaos value. So I'll, I'll run the same prompt again, but this time I'll type in chaos 100 um, to just loosen it up a little bit and see if we can force it to um, do something more interesting. But you, well, I mean, you know, I'm being very critical. I, I still think this is incredible technology. Um, I guess I'll put it back here. Yeah, and, and, and there is sort of like an explanation for this aquarium situation as well. Um, Crowley explains that like these, all these aquariums and stuff are part of how Crowley like smuggles and moves drugs um, because he sort of has the cover that it's aquarium supplies. He gets all sorts of kooky chemicals and equipment in and it, it's all legitimate because, well, it's for his aquarium not for drugs. Um, but then he actually quite likes the fish and is very fond of the wildlife as well. And so, um, uh, and then we can joke about like, you know, having to avoid mixing up the drugs with the aquarium chemicals or else the fish will get high and the customers will get fish food. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure where to insert. I feel like that might've worked better, um, before this bit, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, I don't know, mid-journey, yeah, whatever. Uh, let's continue. Um, Erling rather would like a seat, but since there was only a cushion, he took that. I'll feed... I'll feed the animals out back. Terry looked hungry. I'll feed the animals out back, Belle said. Terry looked hungry. Not too much, Crowley said. Terry had a big breakfast. Terry? <laughs> Erling asked. Um, the marmoset is Belle's favorite, Crowley explained. Erling nodded. How often does Belle come out here? It's a long drive. Um, every couple months or so, Crowley said. Huh. Huh, Erling said. He had no idea. He's known... He'd known Belle forever, but... There was so much he didn't know about her. So, you know, I think this is trying to, like, get Earl out of his um, introspective um, bubble a bit and trying to just expand his perspective out from his own personal emotional problems and trying to 
just expand his perspective to include other people's situations. I think just sort of coming out here and seeing this sort of aspect of Belle's life and her sort of curious relationship with this weird Crowley guy, I, I think even that just begins to shift Erling a little bit. Huh, Erling said. He had no idea. But we're not here to talk about Belle. Crowley said gently. What brought you here, Erling? Um, so how would Erling respond to that? Because, you know, he, he, to he told Bell how he was feeling, only at great pains. Um, how, you know, would he want to talk to this random stranger about his issues who he's barely met? I don't think he, he would want to do that easily. So maybe he would say, you know, um, but we're not here to talk about Bill. What brought you here, Erling? Erling. Erling looked Erling looked at the fish, drifting. But we're not here to talk about Bell, Crowley said gently. What brought you here, Erling? Several fish swam past Crowley's head in the background. Several fish pa several pi several fish swam past Crowley's head in the background, but behind Crowley, several fish swam. Behind Crowley, several fish swam by. Behind Crowley, several f s several fish swam by. It looked. It looked almost as though. They had swam, they had swam in, it looked almost as though they had swam inside Crowley's right ear and exited by his left. Erling. Erling couldn't help but chuckle. He wasn't sure when he left this morning. When he left this morning, he didn't he didn't know where he was going, but he certainly didn't imagine himself here. Something funny. Something funny, Crowley. Something funny, Crowley smiled. Erling. Erling shook his head. No, look, Bell just. No, uh, look, Bell. Bell just thought I should see a doctor. So you know, Erling, Erling projects it, shifts it onto Bell's initiative, even though it was his admission that he needs to see a doctor. Erling shook his head. No, look, Bell just thought I should see a doctor. I've had headaches and sleep problems. You know, it's it's fine. I just and sleep problems. You know, it's it's fine. I just I just get tired sometimes. You know. Crowley nodded. It 
felt like he knew. I mean, I... Erling shook his head. No, look, Bell just thought I should see a doctor. I've, I've had headaches and sleep problems, you know. It's fine, I just... I just get tired sometimes, you know? Crowley nodded. Listening. Crowley nodded. Listening. Uh, at full attention. Crowley nodded, listening attentively. Still with a serene, gentle smile. Crowley, Crowley nodded, listening attentively, still with a serene, gentle smile. Erling felt The more Crowley looked at him, the more annoyed Erling felt. Why was... Why was Bell's drug dealer acting like a goddamn... Goddamn monk. I can handle it. Erling said. I just need to deal with it. You know? It's just dreams. Everyone has dreams. I just need to stop thinking about them all the time. I just need to let them stay in the bed. You know? That's what mother told me about... That's what mother told me when I had nightmares as a kid. She said... She said, nightmares are scary, but they stay in the bed. And when you wake up and leave, and when you wake up, you can leave them behind. And a nightmare can't trouble you in the day. <laughs> That is some terrible advice, isn't it? Nightmares are scary, but they stay in... Well, no, not in the bed. They stay in the pillow. Nightmares are scary, but they stay in the pillow. And when you wake up, you can leave them behind. And a nightmare can't trouble you in the day. So I just need to leave them in the pillow, don't I? Shouldn't stop me... Shouldn't stop me working when there's horses. Shouldn't stop me working when there's horses to feed. And the fences to check. I've just got a deal. Fuck the dreams. Crowley nodded again. I just got a deal. Fuck the dreams. They're nothing. Crowley nodded again. What happens in your dreams? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to. I want to try and move to this dynamic where, like. Uh, Erling has this sort of like defensive 
um, stroppiness to him where he sort of projects anger onto Crowley and sort of tells himself that he's annoyed at Crowley as a way of sort of defending himself from how upset he is about these creepy nightmares. Um, So I want to express that Erling is sort of being grumpy at, at Crowley when he's actually sort of getting somewhere by talking about them. Hmm. Um, uh, Kelly Theobald in the live chat says, I'm going to take off. I like your writing style, Martin. I like how uncomplicated it is. I have a severe overcomplication problem with my own stuff. Haha. <laughs> Till next time. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I guess I try and... I try and make it simple. Like, I, I, I always want to sort of veer into some colourful, um, flowery language sometimes, but I try not to because um, sometimes it just becomes meaningless, you know, too many words. I don't know. Just playing. Um, Crowley nodded again. What happens in your dreams? Just the one dream. Over and over. A storm in a lavender field. Okay, I think we've, we've actually got to wrap up this live stream very shortly. But I think basically what's going to happen is that Erling's going to describe his dream. And, and I think the sort of advice, the sort of wise wisdom that wise Big Rev Crowley offers is that... Um, Erling's instinct is to sort of be defensive and to avoid and to suppress and to not engage with this nightmare that he's having. And Crowley's advice will be to uh, actually try and address it and like fully embrace and explore what this nightmare means and to try and confront it and resolve it, Uh, which, you know... (laughs) Classic, classic uh, psych advice in fiction, I'm sure. Um, and I think that um, I think that the sort of analogy that goes along with that is that Terry the Marmoset um, will be set free um, because, you know, partly to Bell's you know sadness, uh, Terry the Marmoset will have recovered from his lurgies and will be ready and strong enough to go out into the wild again so at the end after this conversation i think uh crowley will set terry free um and that uh, is is sort of a reflection of like erling trying to be freed from his crazy nightmare um and getting to a point where he's able to do that like terry the marmoset and also that parallels like the horse stuff and the horses in captivity and the horses that are being burned and i think that ultimately in the end they're gonna have to address this horse burning thing and um i suspect the i suspect the resolution will be that maybe we shouldn't be burning horses um and maybe the horses need to be freed it's not the most complicated message in the world but i think it works for this story i think that's where it's going um so yeah we'll do another we'll do more we'll do another stream to continue this i think we've got to wrap this up now um but thank you so much for participating, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in the in the live stream. Uh, and yeah, I hope to finish this story in the nearish future. That would be really cool. Um, yeah. All right. I think that's it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you can follow Martin Cordial on Twitter if you'd like. And see you next time. Cheers. <laughs>